Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Before we start the episode, we're going to go to Barcelona in November. I'm so excited. That's November of 2023. If you're listening from the future, this is a trip we have thought about for a while since many years ago when we did some thematically appropriate episodes of the show. Uh, This is a six-night trip. We will be staying in central Barcelona. We've got a lot of fun stuff on the schedule, including city tours, Picasso Museum, Sagrada Familia, a wine tasting, a tapas tasting, a Montserrat day trip with a tour of the Abbey. Uh, All of this is stuff that I am very much looking forward to. And we still have some spaces available. So if you have been thinking about making a trip, maybe November of this year is right for you. So you can go to defineddestinations.com. Right on the front page, there's a a link to the Barcelona trip. Or you can go to defineddestinations.com slash Barcelona-2023. Either way, we'll get you there. Uh, I don't know. Holly, do you have anything you want to add? Listen, I am deeply excited about this. It's going to cure my post-Halloween doldrums. (laughs) This is, uh, we have talked about Barcelona for both of our previous trips as an option. Yeah. And then it got uh, sidelined for other choices. And so it's really it's time, and it's really been one that we have had in mind for now literally years and years. Mm-hmm. I cannot wait. Yeah. I'm so excited. I'm going to eat all, all, all the food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so speaking of travel, but much more local to me travel, a while ago, I learned that one of John Singer Sargent's sisters, Emily Sargent, was a prolific artist but that her work really hasn't been studied very much. And that's not just because she was overshadowed by her very famous brother. She only publicly exhibited her work once during her lifetime. That was only four pieces, and those pieces were all copies rather than her original work. People who knew her described her as an accomplished watercolorist, but her original paintings just didn't really circulate very far beyond family and friends. And then after she died, people thought that those paintings had been lost. That continued to be true until more than 400 of her paintings were found in an attic in England just 25 years ago. So I was very intrigued by Emily Sargent after learning all of that. It seemed like, though, I was not going to be able to find enough information for a full episode on her. It's one of those cases where the information surely exists, but not in places that are kind of centralized and accessible to me as a researcher. And then earlier this year, I learned that the Sargent House Museum in Gloucester, Massachusetts, was going to be exhibiting some of her work this summer. That is where the local travel comes in. I thought... Maybe if I go to this exhibit, I'll be able to pull together enough information about Emily Sargent. So I went to Gloucester. Unfortunately, still did not feel like there would be enough information. But the Sargent House Museum was built for another sergeant. That was Judith Sargent Murray. Today, the museum is focused primarily on her life and legacy, I really didn't know much about her before going to this museum, and I wound up being intrigued by her as well in terms of her life story and her writing on women's rights, her influence on the spread of universalism in North America. So these two women were related. Judith's brother, Winthrop, was the great-great-grandfather of John Singer and Emily Sargent, And John and Emily also had their own connections to Sargent House as it was turned from a private home into a museum. So I decided today's episode should be about two sergeants, Judith and Emily. Judith Sargent was born in Gloucester, Massachusetts on May 1st, 1751. Gloucester is on Cape Ann, ancestral home of the Pawtucket people, although early colonial records use a lot of different names to describe the indigenous people of this area. 
Some of these are the names of other indigenous peoples or nations, or of the towns where they were living, or the name of whoever was holding the role of sachem or leader at the time the person was writing. This is one of those things that has made the indigenous history of this area difficult to document today. Another is that a number of histories of Cape Ann that were written in the 18th and 19th centuries describe it as uninhabited. This is not true, though. Samuel de Champlain described meeting about 200 indigenous people on Cape Ann in 1606. Other 17th century accounts of Cape Ann also describe indigenous people and include their settlements on maps. Some of this erasure stems from how long it took for England to successfully establish a permanent colony on Cape Ann. By the time Gloucester was incorporated as part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1642, many of the indigenous people of Cape Ann had died due to violence or disease or had left the area to try to escape those things. So newly arrived colonists imagined that they were building homes on land that had never been inhabited. But there were also people who were aware of this earlier history and intentionally obfuscated it in their own accounts. Yeah, when working on this, I found specifically the history of indigenous peoples in Cape Ann to be more vague and contradictory than in other parts of Massachusetts and New England more broadly. It was very frustrating. Uh, In terms of the sergeants, they first arrived in North America about a century before Judith was born. And at first, they were farmers. That was a pretty challenging life on Cape Ann, thanks to both the climate and some generally rocky ground. But as the Gloucester economy shifted toward fishing and shipping, the sergeants became wealthy. Judith was the oldest of eight children born to Winthrop Sargent and Judith Saunders Sargent, although only four of those children lived to adulthood. By that point, by the time Judith was born, the sergeant name really carried a lot of respect and influence. One of Judith's biggest frustrations, and one that really stayed with her for her whole life, was that she wasn't given the same education as her brother. She did have a couple of tutors who taught her the basics of how to read, and some accounts say that her parents let her sit in on Winthrop's lessons as he prepared to go to Harvard. Her later writings suggest that this wasn't the case, though. She described herself as, quote, wild and untutored and expressed the frustration that she just wasn't allowed to follow along with her brother's studies with a tutor who was already there. Instead, Judith did a lot of study on her own in her family's extensive library. That library was a huge luxury at this point. She was an avid reader, including Shakespeare, other works of classic British literature, philosophy, and religious works, and lighter material as well. She was fond of reading romance, although later in her life, she seems to have thought she was kind of wasting her time reading this kind of work when she was younger. When Judith was about 18, she had her portrait painted by John Singleton Copley, who was regarded as one of the best portraitists in North America. She's shown in a drapey flowing silk dress without a corset and a blue overdress, holding a basket of roses and wearing a turban-like hat. This may have been painted to show off her beauty to potential suitors or to celebrate her betrothal to John Stevens, who she married on October 3rd, 1769. Yeah, uh, in my opinion, this painting itself is very beautiful, and she looks very beautiful in it. Uh, on the surface... This seemed like a pretty reasonable match. Stevens was charming and handsome and a successful merchant and ship captain. Like the sergeants, the Stevenses had been in Gloucester for generations, and these two families were friends. But Judith was only 18, and John was a decade older than that. Later on, she said she had been too young to get married and that women should not get married until they were at least 25. Judith desperately wanted children, but she and John never had any, and we can really only speculate as to why that was. John also inherited some financial trouble following the death of his father, and the couple frequently had trouble making ends meet. On top of all that, he was away from home a lot because of his work. This marriage just wasn't what Judith had hoped that it would be. She was disappointed on multiple levels, 
She even speculated that reading those romances had set her expectations too high. Judith also lived through a lot of change in the early years of her marriage. In 1770, her father Winthrop wed Welsh theologian James Relly's Union, or a treatise of the consanguinity and affinity between Christ and his church. Although Relly had started out as a Methodist minister, this work reflected his thoughts on universalism. In this context, that's the idea that through God's love and grace, all of humanity would be saved. If you listen to our recent episode on Mary Dyer, you may remember our discussion of Puritanism, which taught that only a select few people would be saved. One of Puritanism's successors in New England was Congregationalism, which had a similar approach to the idea of salvation. Both of these religious movements were influenced by the 16th century teachings of John Calvin, and while some elements of early universalism were still pretty in line with Calvinist thought, this idea of universal salvation was incredibly radical and controversial. So when the sergeants started having meetings in their home to talk about Raleigh's ideas, at first, they were really quiet about it. Then, on November 3rd, 1774, John Murray visited the sergeant home at the Elder Winthrop's invitation. Murray had originally been a Calvinistic Methodist who vehemently disagreed with Relly, but he had become a Universalist after listening to Relly's sermons for himself. Judith had already been inspired by Universalist ideas, and she started corresponding with John Murray. She wrote a letter to him that said in part, quote, I am not much accustomed to writing letters, especially to your sex, but if there be neither male nor female in the Emmanuel you promulgate, we may surely, and with the strictest propriety, mingle souls upon paper. This wasn't just something Judith wasn't accustomed to. It was very unusual for a woman to start writing to a man who was not her relative, and it was not seen as proper at all. In 1779, the sergeants and some of Murray's other followers split away from Gloucester's first parish church, and they established a new congregation. That was the Independent Christian Church, which is recognized as the first universalist congregation in North America. And this was an enormous deal. Apart from the inherent controversy surrounding universalism, Religion and the church were deeply interconnected with everything about Gloucester society, and this effectively caused a schism at First Paris Church. This was a huge social and religious upheaval. Of course, by 1779, the colonies were also at war with England, so there was a lot of other fear, uncertainty, and potential danger going on. Judith's brother Winthrop had been named an aide-de-camp to George Washington. John Murray had, for a time, served as chaplain for the Continental Army in Rhode Island. And Judith's husband John had started working as a privateer, which was financially lucrative. Judith didn't really approve of privateering from a moral standpoint, and she had some doubts that a war could be moral at all. But she generally supported the revolution, at least in an intellectual sense. She didn't really get directly or publicly involved uh, beyond, like, the day-to-day experiences of living in coastal New England during the war. Like, she was, there were times, like, she had to flee her home because of a, a, a suspected incoming British attack, but she didn't, like, actively go out to help uh, in a, like, physical, meaningful way with the revolution. We are going to talk about Judith Stevens's life after the Revolutionary War, after we have a sponsor break. Although Judith Stevens didn't entirely approve of her husband John's privateering, the money that he earned by doing it did mean that he could finally afford to have a home built for them, and that home was finished in 1782. By that point, their family had gotten larger. John's sister had died in 1780, and they took in two of his nieces, Anna and Mary, and then later, one of Judith's cousins came to live with them as well. Judith had also started writing 
including a 1779 essay called The Sexes on the Spiritual and Intellectual Equality of Men and Women, although she hadn't really started sharing her work beyond family and friends yet. Judah's first published work came out the same year as their house was built, although it was published anonymously. This was the first universalist catechism to be published in the U.S., and it was intended for children. She had originally written it to help explain their beliefs to her husband's nieces. Soon, she was publishing more work, including essays and poetry, much of it under pseudonyms, although eventually people did connect the dots between Judith and her various pen names. Judith was ambitious with her writing. She liked doing it, and she really wanted to be successful. She also had strong opinions, and her writing gave her an outlet for those opinions. As the Revolutionary War ended, she really hoped that she could encourage the newly established United States to envision itself as a society in which women and men were seen and treated as equals— Her first published work on the rights of women came out in 1784. That was desultory thoughts on the ability of encouraging a degree of self-complacency, especially in female bosoms. That was published under the pen name Constantia. But she was also driven by financial need. As the war ended, John's work as a privateer collapsed, which brought all of his existing financial issues right back to the surface. Some of this, like the debts he inherited from his father and the effects of the war on shipping, was just beyond his control. But he also made some poor financial decisions and bad investments of his own. In 1786, he fled to the Caribbean, both to escape his creditors and to try to find a way to fix his financial situation there. But he didn't get a chance to do that because he died of some kind of illness on March 8, 1787, without ever returning to the U.S. Judith was mortified. She immediately went back to using the name Judith Sargent, John had signed the house over to her father before he left the country, and as a widow, she had some legal protections for the money that she had brought into the marriage. But she was left without an income, and her late husband's creditors still had to be paid. She had to sell a lot of her possessions, although she was able to sell some things to her brother, and he basically loaned them back to her. Beyond the basic financial stress in all this, Judith Sargent had been raised in wealth. She was really proud of being one of the sergeants of Gloucester. She just thought she deserved more. She also had to start charging money to a boarder who had been staying in their home for free. And that border was John Murray. And again, this was kind of scandalous. There was a lot of gossip when the newly widowed Judith Sargent did not make this unmarried man move out of her home. Unsurprisingly, there were rumors that Sargent and Murray had been having a physical affair while John Stevens was still alive. That does not seem to be the case, but it does seem as though Murray had developed feelings for her. Ultimately, she reciprocated those feelings, and Judith Sargent and John Murray married on October 6, 1788. This time, she kept using Sargent as part of her name. Julia's second marriage was one of both joy and grief. She and John Murray were a lot more emotionally and intellectually compatible than she and John Stevens had been, and they seemed to have really loved one another. Judith became instrumental to the spread of universalism in North America, traveling with Murray on his speaking tours and helping to edit his work. She met and became connected to a number of prominent figures, including John and Abigail Adams, George and Martha Washington, and Benjamin Franklin and his daughter, Sarah Franklin Bache. She enjoyed meeting and corresponding with all these people, sharing her thoughts on how she hoped the new republic would be one of equality between the sexes and freedom and autonomy for women. But on August 5th, 1789, Judith and John had a son who they named George, and George unfortunately died at birth. This would have been heartbreaking on its own, but the details seem particularly tragic. Judith's labor was extremely prolonged and difficult, and weeks passed before she really started to recover physically. 
1790, Judith Sargent Murray published On the Equality of Sexes, again under the pen name Constantia. It ran in the Massachusetts Magazine over two issues and was prefaced by a poem she had written. This was revised and expanded from her earlier essay, The Sexes, and it argued that women and men were equal and that women were being kept from reaching their full potential by being denied the same educations and and other opportunities as men. Judith Sargent Murray published this essay two years before Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Woman was published in the UK, and it was four years before that work was published in full in the United States. And while they have some similarities, one key difference between these two works is that Wollstonecraft argued for equality in terms of both gender and class. But Judith Sargent Murray was focused mainly on the lives of upper-class women being given access to the same rights as upper-class men already had. She didn't really give any thought to people of other classes at all. Also, Murray's thoughts on the rights of women were also really connected to the idea of Republican motherhood. That's the idea that was very popular in the early Republic, that women should pass the ideals of the new Republic down to their children. Women had a critical role in raising patriotic, moral, educated citizens. So while she called very stridently for women and girls to be treated as the intellectual and spiritual equals of men and to be able to support themselves and to actively participate in politics and society, she was also connecting all of these rights to a very clear set of gender roles and to the idea of women having a particular place in the family and in society. She also really thought that while women should have their own autonomy and agency in their marriages, they should always put their children first. On August 22nd, 1791, Murray gave birth to a daughter, Julia Maria, who she absolutely adored. The earlier death of her son George combined with the challenges of becoming a mother at 40 to make her very focused on her own health and that of her daughter. She stopped traveling with her husband for a time while she was breastfeeding, and she really devoted herself to raising her child. She did get back to writing pretty quickly, often in a tiny room in the house in Gloucester, which was basically a closet. Murray started publishing work in the Massachusetts Magazine under a male persona called The Gleaner in 1792. A year later, John was named minister at Boston's Universalist Church, and the family moved from Gloucester to Boston. Judith hoped this new job would help John earn a bigger income, in part because she really missed the kind of comfort that she had been raised in, but it turned out he wasn't always paid on time, and Boston was just a lot more expensive to live in than Gloucester. In 1795, after Boston lifted its ban on theatrical productions, Murray tried her hand at writing plays. In one story, she sneaked out while her husband was preaching to see her first play, wearing a disguise since many people still considered theater to be a vice. The medium, or a happy tea party, was staged at the Federal Street Theater in 1795, followed by The Traveler Returned a year later. Neither of these plays was reviewed very well, and neither earned much money, though. In 1798, she published The Gleaner, which was a three-volume work of her collected writings, again with the hope of making money through subscriptions. Although she had endorsements from people like George Washington and John Adams, this was, again, not the runaway financial success that she was hoping for. Yeah, I think had her hopes not been as high as they were, I think she probably would have thought that it had done fine. Uh, After that three-volume work came out, Judith really started focusing more on editing her husband's work on universalism and on some other projects instead of continuing on her own writing. For example, she helped her cousin Judith Saunders and Clementine Beach open an academy for girls in Dorchester, Massachusetts in 1802. In 1806, the first Universalist Meeting House was built in Gloucester on land that was donated by Winthrop Sargent. It still stands today. It is home to the Gloucester Unitarian Universalist Church, and it's on the National Register of Historic Places. One more play of Murray's was staged in 1808. That was called The African, although its text seems to have been lost. In 
John Murray had a stroke in 1809 and was partially paralyzed. And after that, Judith spent a lot of her time focused on his care. Then in 1812, she faced another potential scandal. On August 26th of that year, her daughter Julia eloped with a recent Harvard graduate named Adam Lewis Bingaman. While Judith and John had given their daughter their blessing, Adam's family, who were planters in Natchez, Mississippi, apparently hoped that he would marry somebody who would add to the family's holdings in terms of both land and enslaved workforce. Julia and Adam had gotten married in secret without his family's permission, and uh, Julia was also clearly pregnant before their marriage was announced. Judith found all of this shocking, with the added layer that she had published writing that condemned secret marriages. But her devotion to her daughter seems to have outweighed any of her other feelings on the matter. Eventually, Julia's marriage to Adam was formally announced, and their daughter Charlotte was born in 1813. This didn't resolve all the couple's challenges, though. Adam's family expected him to be back in Mississippi, but Julia did not really want to leave Massachusetts or her mother, and Judith didn't want to be separated from her daughter at all. Julia wound up staying in Massachusetts for years, but living on the other side of the country from her husband was so unusual that she basically stopped socializing rather than having to deal with people's judgment about it. Kind of understand that. Uh, Judith edited John Murray's Letters and Sketches of Sermons in 1813. But at this point, writing was becoming more difficult for her. She was starting to lose her eyesight, which made it a lot harder for her to read and write, especially when she had to do that by candlelight. John Murray died on September 3rd, 1815. After his death, Judith finished his autobiography that was records of the life of the Reverend John Murray, written by himself, with a continuation by Mrs. Judith Sargent Murray. Uh, She published that in 1816. And then at some point after that, she moved to Natchez to be with her daughter, who the Binghamans had finally convinced to move there and join her husband. Although Judith Sargent Murray wrote a lot about politics, education, and the rights of women, she really did not say much about slavery in her surviving correspondence and work. She does seem to have ultimately disagreed with the institution, although some of her most concrete comments on the subject are more about slavery's damaging effect on white people who were exposed to it than about the enslaved people themselves. She also benefited from slavery for a lot of her life. Prior to the abolition of slavery in Massachusetts in 1783, members of her family had enslaved household staff. That included her parents and her first husband, John Stevens' parents. According to tax records, John and Judith had at least one, quote, servant for life in their household. By the time Judith moved to Natchez, her brother Winthrop was living there also. He had been named governor of Mississippi Territory, and had married a widow named Mary McIntosh Williams. The Williams estate included at least a hundred enslaved people, and Judith's correspondence about her brother's marriage really suggests a sense of pride at how wealthy and large the estate was, not really any kind of judgment or horror over slavery. There are a lot of accounts written in recent years that describe Judith Sargent Murray as one of North America's first feminists. And it is definitely true that she advocated for affluent white women to have the same rights as affluent white men, especially when it came to things like education. We already talked about how her work really didn't extend to women of lower economic classes, and she did not advocate for enslaved women or enslaved people more broadly at all. They really have no idea, like, what her thoughts are about the fact that she spent the last years of her life in a slave state being cared for and supported by an enslaved workforce. Um, Various correspondence and written records suggest that Judith Sargent Murray hoped to return to Massachusetts one day, but she died in Natchez, Mississippi on July 6, 1820, at the age of 69. She was buried in the Bingaman Family Cemetery. There's still more to discover about her biography. In 1984, Unitarian Universalist minister Gordon Gibson found her letter books containing her copies of thousands of letters. He found that in Natchez. Uh, 
The historian who has done the most work with these so far is Sheila L. Skemp, who published Judith Sargent Murray, a brief biography with documents in 1998, and First Lady of Letters, Judith Sargent Murray and the Struggle for Female Independence in 2009. After a quick sponsor break, we will talk about her distant niece, Emily Sargent. Emily Sargent was born in Rome on January 29, 1857, so a little more than 100 years after the birth of Judith Sargent Murray. Emily's brother, John Singer Sargent, had been born in Florence the year before. Their father, Fitzwilliam Sargent, had been born in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and their mother, Mary, was from Philadelphia. Mary was described as a cultured woman, vivacious and restless, who had convinced Fitzwilliam to give up his surgical practice so they could live in Europe. One factor in this may have been the death of their first child in infancy. Afterward, Mary was understandably worried about her own health and that of her children. The sergeants had kind of a wandering life around Europe, moving to warmer places in the winter and cooler places in the summer, living mostly off of money Fitzwilliam had saved from his surgical practice and some money that Mary had inherited. Yeah, this wasn't a huge inheritance, but it was enough to allow them to do this. They also weren't the only family living this way. The sergeants also came up in our episode on writer Violet Paget, also known as Vernon Lee. The Pagets had a really similar lifestyle to the sergeants, finding it more affordable to drift around Europe than to maintain a permanent home somewhere. The sergeants and the Pagets became close friends, and Emily Sargent and Vernon Lee visited each other regularly throughout their lives. The third surviving sergeant child was born in 1870 when Emily and John were already teenagers. That child was named after Violet Paget, who was also their godmother. Emily Sargent experienced a serious spinal injury or possibly a spinal disease when she was about four years old. While she was recovering, doctors told her parents to keep her totally immobile. This included restraining her at night so she couldn't move around in her sleep. This made the effects of the injury worse, and for the rest of her life, Emily dealt with pain, mobility issues, and a spinal curvature that affected her posture. Emily and her brother were very close for their whole lives. Since they were only about a year apart and they lived this wandering existence while they were growing up, they were each other's closest friends and playmates. They also made plenty of other friends over the course of their lives, and overall, the sergeants really had a reputation of always going out of their way to help and support the people that they loved when they needed it. As they grew up and John Singer Sargent started developing a reputation for himself as an artist, Emily became known for being very sweet-tempered and charming and for acting as host for her brother's parties, dinners, and other gatherings. Unlike her brother, Emily never formally studied art. She learned by copying the works of other artists and through practice. She started really devoting herself to art after the death of their father in 1889, doing a lot of her work outdoors, hauling her supplies from place to place in a pram. She did a lot of her original work in watercolor, painting the people and places they encountered in their travels. Yeah, the exhibit at the Sargent House Museum described it almost as like a journal in watercolor. After spending more than 30 years moving from place to place, Emily had her first permanent home starting in the early 1890s. This was a flat in the Chelsea neighborhood of London, close to her brother's studio, and their mother lived there with her as well until her death in 1906. After that point, Emily lived on her own, still close to her brother. While living in Chelsea, Emily became friends with her neighbor, Henry James, who keeps coming up in episodes. Uh, That included helping to care for him after he had a stroke. I feel like we should just start acknowledging that there has to be a Henry James episode at some point to tie (laughs) all of these threads together. Neither Emily nor John Singer Sargent ever married or had children, but they both doted on their sister Violet's children. Violet's daughter, Rosemarie, was one of John's favorite models and is sometimes described as his muse. In 1914, at the start of World War I, Emily Sargent was in northern France, and her family was worried for her safety until she was able to return to London. 
Meanwhile, John Singer Sargent wound up trapped in Austria for a while. He was described as kind of heedless of the potential dangers of remaining there as the war was starting. Rosemary's husband was killed in action in 1914, and that was just a year into their marriage. The whole family was heartbroken over this, and then Rosemary herself was also killed. She was attending services at the Church of Saint Gervais in Paris, and that was struck by a German bombardment on March 29, 1918, which was Good Friday. After the war, Emily and John Singer Sargent spent some time in the U.S., where they became friends with past podcast subject Isabella Stewart Gardner. Gardner was unwell, and the sergeants often used her seats at concerts in the theater. While they were in the U.S., John helped transform Judith Sargent Murray's former home in Gloucester into a museum. At that point, the home had been through a series of other private owners. The Met Museum had been seeking architectural elements for its collection, and one of the pieces the Met was interested in was Sargent House's central staircase. This is a beautiful handmade staircase with these spiraling balusters and two different alternating designs. Residents of Gloucester and others who were connected to this home in some way didn't didn't really like the idea of losing the staircase or potentially losing the house that it was part of. So a group of local residents started raising money to try to preserve it. John Singer Sargent helped to contribute funds and also to restore the home including sourcing and donating wallpaper for some of the rooms. The Sargent House Museum opened in 1919, and John and Emily visited it after it opened. Their names are in the guest book. John Singer Sargent died in 1925, and afterward, Emily went to live with her sister Violet Ormond in Tunisia. She later also donated some of her brother's work to the Sargent House Museum, including his portraits of their father and mother. Emily also donated three of her own watercolors to the museum, and Violet Ormond donated one of Emily's watercolors in 1928. As we said earlier, Emily Sargent and Vernon Lee each visited each other regularly throughout their lives. The last of those visits was for a week in 1932. That was about three years before Vernon Lee's death. Emily Sargent died on May 22, 1936, at the age of 79. Her cause of death is described as an accident. According to one report, a bicyclist ran into her while she was walking. She was buried alongside her brother at Brookwood Cemetery in Surrey, England. As we said earlier, after her death, Emily's artwork was presumed to be lost until more than 400 of her paintings were discovered in an attic of a Sargent family home in England in 1998. Over the last few years, the Sargent family has donated many of these works to museums. Paintings from Emily's collection have gone to the Sargent House Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., the Tate Gallery in London, and the Ashmolean Museum of Art and Archaeology at Oxford University. The museum receiving the largest number of these paintings uh, was the Boston MFA with 41. And Sargent House, which is the smallest of all these museums and is only open seasonally, received the smallest number at 15. I think in the future there will be an MFA exhibit that maybe we'll have some more information on Emily. And we mentioned earlier that there was more research that could still be done about Judith Sargent Murray, and the same is true about Emily Sargent. Uh, There is a lot that can be learned about her from a lot of the same sources that have been used to research her brother. But as of now, there is not, at least to Tracy's knowledge and research, a full biography of her at all. Yeah, I feel like this, uh, even at a third of today's episode, is like kind of a sketchy (laughs) overview of everything I could find out. Right. Do you have a listener mail for us? I do. It's a correction. This is from Hallie. Hallie wrote, Hi, Holly and Tracy. Love the podcast and all the work you do. Been listening since 2019 and unearthed is always a favorite. I learned so much from the podcast and so many anecdotes I tell friends are from the podcast that I always end up promoting it. Just so you know, in today's episode, you referenced Anu, the Museum of the Jewish People in Tel Aviv, 
and you pronounced it wrong. It's confusing that it's all uppercase, but it's not an acronym. It's a word, so it's pronounced like Anu. In Hebrew, Anu means us or we. It's one of my favorite museums since it showcases the diversity of Jewish life when so many Jewish museums are about the Holocaust and Jewish death, which are very important as well. If you're ever in Tel Aviv, you should definitely visit. Or if you're in D.C., you should come to the Capitol Jewish Museum. Best, Hallie. Thank you so much for this correction, Hallie. You are exactly right. I was thrown by the fact that that is presented in all capital letters. So I thought that it was uh, an acronym and not a word. Um, uh, I have not been to Tel Aviv at all. I have not been uh, to the Capitol Jewish Museum, but a couple of museums that I have been to that I wanted to just kind of shout out to you if folks are near those areas and interested. Um, there's the Weizmann National Museum of Jewish History in Philadelphia, um, which has inspired a couple of episodes of the show. Um, and that one looks specifically at, like, the Jewish-American experience. And then there's the Bremen Museum of Jewish Culture and History, which is in Atlanta, which uh, we have interviewed someone from there on the show. Uh, and I've also visited that one, and I think, Holly, you maybe have as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so thank you so much for that correction. I'm sorry for messing that up. If you would like to send us a note about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com and we're all over social media and Myths in History, which is where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and wherever else you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.